So good evening, uh, everyone, and welcome to our Vivardis uh, first All You Can Ask session focused on Corodont Repair Fluoride Plus. And as we received so many questions about uh, Corodont Repair Fluoride Plus, we decided to invite two exceptional users to share their experience. This is going to be really an open discussion. We receive a lot of questions, as I said before, and we cluster them in uh, different uh, questions that I will prompt to the two panelists. Uh, as you know, our two panelists are Dr. Jeanette McLean, <laughs> welcome, which is Hello. a board certified pediatric dentist in private practice in Arizona and an advocate for minimal invasive dentistry. And of course, we also have Dr. Brian Novi, <laughs> <laughs> which is the chief dental officer of the Alliance Dental Center, Massachusetts and with faculty appointments at Harvard School of Dental Medicine and Western University. So welcome, both of you. And uh, if you're ready, I can start with the first question. So first, first question please. will be for Dr. Novi to start answering, and he is, can you please share what the Curodont Repair Fluoride Plus is and what to make it innovative in the dental industry? Why would you, our dental team want to recommend it? And uh, is it for watch areas? What is the clinical data supporting it? So I, I mean, I think any clinician, every clinician has to come up with their own way to describe this to a patient. But the way I describe it to a patient, and I think, Jeanette, you should jump in and, and explain how you do, because I think I'm having conversations with adults. You're having conversations with, with kiddos and parents, more, and much, parents. Probably much more so than I am. So as I explain it to, well, actually, I explain it to, we explain it to dentists a lot too, don't we? Prior to having this kind of technology, remineralization stopped at the surface zone of the lesion. So if you remember those, the zones of the caries lesion from dental school. So if you looked at a sectioned caries lesion with the pole, with polarized light microscopy, you see the surface zone, the body zone, the dark zone, the translucent zone, the zone of destruction and all those, all those zones beneath there. We've never really had anything that couldn't get past that surface zone because the surface zone of the caries lesion is always the most stable, is not stable, it's the most solid part of the caries lesion because those ions are leaving the tooth, moving up to the surface and the acquired enamel pellicle is causing those ions to not re precipitate out of solution, but re-harden at that surface zone. So prior to this, anything you put on top of the caries lesion stopped at that first calcium ion it found. But Curidont is completely different because it self-assembles, number one, at the pH inside the caries lesion. So it turns into an active, I mean, if you want to think about it, I, Jeanette, I don't know if you think about it like enzymes and tertiary versus quaternary structures of proteins, but as it self-assembles, it, it's actually growing down into the tooth. And I, I think of it like healing by secondary intention for the tooth. That's kind of the way I, I think of it, because yeah. I, I think of these tentacles growing down, and then when they meet in the bottom of the lesion... Then it starts cross-linking. And what you've really done is created just a ton of binding sites for calcium from the saliva to come in and remineralize that lesion. So how is it different than anything else? This actually penetrates deep into the tooth and it gives us the ability to remineralize deeper than we ever have before. And I think that's that's the difference, this between Curidon versus some of the other remineralization technologies. Can I, I, and then I'll jump in. And I think the way that I would simplify how it's unique mm -hmm. is it's the only and the first treatment that we have that's actually guided hard tissue regeneration, right? Versus like putting topical fluorides. And like you said, sort of treating the outer surface. This is the only thing where we're actually helping to regrow enamel and growing the hydroxyapatite crystal. So it's it's really healing the caries lesion versus just trying to stop it from getting worse. Um, that's how I would explain it to a dentist. And then to, did you want to like, how, how do you, how are you explaining it to your adult patients? Well, my adult patients are already really, I mean, my adult patients know that I'm going to try to reverse the cavities. I mean, we talk a lot about um, reversal of your disease. Yeah. Um, or arresting it. And so my patients are on board with, with the concept of remineralization. I'm thinking I have, I don't think I have a patient out there who's like, uh, no, I'm not into this. Um, so as I'm talking to patients, it's more like, well, they have their remineralization products that they take home, but we have the stuff that we do in the office as well. Then all the parents, the parents really, it resonates with them because they're now, you know, my age or they're in their thirties, forties, fifties, and they're having to get all the redo dentistry done. So they 
totally understand and that there's very high acceptance rate because they understand like if we could prevent having to do fillings, we're going to help extend the life of their natural dentition. So that's basically how I explain it. I, I love what you just said, Jeanette, because I think that is so key. <clears throat> I think so many people view caries disease management as this, well, if I do this, then I'm never going to have to worry about caries in this patient again. And I think we need to open people's minds to the notion of products like Cured Up and all of our remineralization technology. It gives us more time to build rapport with patients and it, avoid, it, it avoids initiating the restorative cycle at the first sign of the disease now, because we right. have these things that allow us to say, no, let's stop and reverse the disease. We have the opportunity to do that. We know the science tells us it works. So let's, before we do anything else, let's try this. And I think for those of you who haven't, I, I feel like we got a sense from the, the, the emails before this, that there was so much energy building out there from, I mean, my, hundreds of questions come, have come flooding into our email inboxes today, getting ready for this. I think it's it's remarkable that so many clinicians are really excited about, oh my gosh, there's a new type of remineralization agent out there. And I would say to Jeanette's point, this is more so than just another remineralization agent. This is a game changer. Um, so much so that the CDT code for it, which I don't know if we're allowed to talk about. It's, it's coming, you can say it's coming 2024. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So, I mean, just the, the language that goes along with that is quite uh, remarkable. Right. Um, and, and patients appreciate being given less invasive options. I think a lot of dentists who or, or other oral health care providers, hygienists, dental therapists, if they're not already offering these, they don't know what they're missing and don't realize that there is such a high acceptance, even if insurance doesn't cover it. The majority want to pay and are willing to pay out of pocket for these treatments because they do understand the concept that you can reverse early stage cavities. I think because we live in a digital age, patients know a lot more than, than we give them credit for. Like they're looking up treatments and they can find out about this stuff online. And people come to me because I offer these things, yeah. because I offer Curidon or SDF, resin infiltration. You know, people want non invasive options. So it's a practice builder. And it also, I feel, helps retain your existing patients um, as opposed to being stuck in the 80s. <laughs> so I don't know, maybe um, there is one question that is from the, would it be, would this be a good choice for my long-term care, long care patient? So I think it fits with what you were saying, right? For a long-term care patient? Absolutely. I've got, so I've, I've, the, we were talking about the very first patient I applied in, which is back in 2017, when I first got the product from out of the hands of, of Dr. Lysik, and I took it back to the office, and I thought the first patient to put this on is my patient with trigeminal neuralgia who can't brush her teeth, and I've got that active spot on the facial surface of her lower mandibular canine, which, let's be honest, you don't want to see a caries lesion on a mandibular canine. It means the patient is an extremely high-risk patient, but this patient is terrified to come see me. And she doesn't want to come to the dentist. She hates coming to the dentist, although granted she likes me, but she's terrified of the dentist. <laughs> and I'm thinking, well, I don't want to do anything that's invasive because my gosh, just even taking me brushing her teeth is it can aggravate her trigeminal neuralgia. So I've been applying Curidon to her teeth and that's all I've done to her since 2017. And it, one could go back and look at my treatment notes back at the Dental Pastoral Health Center. Um, Amy stopped having restorations and fillings after that. So- um, and because we have something that just it was a game changer in what we could do, which may I say, and doesn't turn teeth black. Granted, silver diamond fluoride doesn't turn teeth black. It only turns the caries lesion, that dark discoloration. You can do something about it, but this does not have that effect at all. Right. Um, and we'll elaborate more on, on this versus sorry. SDF later. Yeah, I'm <laughs> sorry. I'm, I'm jumping the gun, but okay. we did miss so about the, the, the evidence. So we, we should mention that there's, a lot of, uh, there's clinical trial evidence in vivo, in, in vitro, um, and there's actually um, an article in, what do they call it, in print, meaning it's been accepted by the, by JADA, so the Journal of American Dental Association, you're, you're um, a talk, systematic review and meta-analysis that, yeah. Are you allowed to tell about, talk about that? Oh yeah, it's yeah. been like accepted. Okay, All right, well, you not me, because you yeah. not me. Okay. <laughs> no worries. But anyway, yes, it's yes, evidence based. There is evidence. There, <laughs> there is evidence. And 
And may I say, we have the evidence and you also have your own sound clinical judgment, which is a piece of the evidence and the right. patient's wants and needs, which I can't think of any patient who wouldn't want to reverse their caries lesions with a liquid rather than rather than a drill. So right. I, I think it meets the, the criteria for evidence-based clinical decision-making. Just for fun, I'm going to pop open and just let some of these different studies float in the background. <laughs> like wallpaper, you. pretty, pretty wallpaper. Oh my goodness. Look at all these studies. Yes, I love we, reading we articles. Have actually uh, evidence. Yes. Or no. <laughs> okay. <Articles. laughs> I think I will move to the second questions because we have a few, <laughs> few to complete. Yes. <laughs> Um, so the question was, and then uh, maybe we can answer it with, the, with you, Janet. What is the best method you have found for placing cordant repair in general and interproximally? What are your thoughts on placing orthodontic separators several days before to assist in application? Okay. Can you apply cordant with braces in place? Any tips and tricks? So many tips and tricks. So, um, you know, the basics are you're going to clean the tooth surface, um, you wanna isolate, right? You're gonna etch, you can apply bleach as well. We could, maybe that's a, something we can debate back and forth because some studies also add bleach, some don't. Um, but anyhow, once it's clean and isolated and, and dry, you're going to activate the applicator. This is critically important, okay? That little vial that's separate from the sponge that you push the sponge into, that liquid, that's not where the magic is, right? right? That's basically distilled water, right. meaning you can't go and get a micro brush and dip it in that liquid. It's not like putting it in unit dose SDF. They're, the liquid is not the magic. The magic, the technology, the peptide is in the sponge. You have to activate it by putting it in the distilled water. And that way the monomers, the peptides can flow out into the lesion. You, you could put orthodontic separators and bring them back but you don't have to. And my thought is keep it simple. Why would you wanna add extra steps if it's not necessary? Because you've got better things to do with your time. Your patients definitely have better things to do with their time. You know, it's just not necessary. Like keep it simple. Um, and what you do to get it in approximately, like, and I didn't understand this initially because I didn't know enough about it when I first started out is you're just trying to get the liquid from the sponge into the surface, right? That's where the magic is. The liquid has to come from the sponge into the tooth. So the sponge, at first, it might be a little awkward for you. The more you use it, the, the more used to it you'll get. But you can use an instrument like a plastic instrument or a haul and back and help to press it against the surface that you're treating. So here I'm treating a proximal lesion, but I'm pressing it into the area from the buckle. You can also put it over the occlusal and from the lingual aspect to just squeeze all of the liquid out of the sponge into the contact area and you're allowing it to absorb for five minutes. Um, so it's as simple as that. And, and you can apply it around orthodontic brackets. Let me show you. This is a lecture I'm gonna do for young specialties. I think we're gonna do it August 23rd, um, but let me show you a couple examples. So here's a patient in active orthodontic treatment with white spots forming all around the brackets. Do we want to just watch and wait this? Uh, wait, you know, just wait and watch. No, we're going to watch it become holes. I don't want to do that. Um, could you do resin infiltration while they're in active treatment? No. So, you know, why just let this get worse? Obviously, you're not going to put SDF because you don't want to stain white spot lesions on their permanent teeth in the aesthetic zone. That, that would not be a great idea. Um, you could do stuff like prescription strength toothpaste, but that's just going to hypermineralize the outer surface and block any penetration deeper of calcium. You could do MI paste. I mean, I, it, they could use it regularly, but again, it's not going to be able to penetrate it once the surface is hypermineralized. So do curidon. So in, in their case, I did apply curidon and you just apply it around the brackets, right? So this is them a year later and it does look better. I mean, it won't necessarily improve aesthetically 100%. And we can elaborate more on that when we get into uh, appearance and this versus resin infiltration. Um, but it did help re reduce that chalky white 
You look know, at the papilla. I mean, look, at, look at your papilla one year later. Your papilla looks a heck of a lot better there. Everything Just, looks better. Everything, um, right, yeah, but I mean, I'm looking at that going, come on, you have a teenager in, in active ortho there a year later, which yeah. clearly would have gone to cavitation. Yeah. If, if something if or, or look at this kid. I mean, look at the gum line gingivitis, right? You know, why are we just going to let this get worse? They're, they're too young to do other things. I don't want to drill and fill this. So you could do cure it on, on an, on an example like this. So did that answer all in that section? I right. So, so there was a question about this, okay. if there is the need of using separators. Um, yeah, you don't, you don't have to. Yep, just squeeze it out of the of the sponge into the the contact area. And that may I, I may I interject? Enough. Yes, please do. So uh, in the clinical technique, what I have found is you have to get used to actually working with both hands, or you and your assistant have to get used to using your hands, one of your hands from each person together. So, I Jeanette, I'm exactly like you. Excuse me, I'm sorry, Doctor McLean. Um, you can also <laughs> call me Jeanette. <laughs> call me Brian too. Um, I, what we do in our office is like, I love what that, this is a great picture because if you're using this for the first time, it's kind of like using a floppy mop and like, but I can't get it to work. But when you hold it, either if you just pin the end of that little applicator in approximately and hold it there with anything like a half Hollenbach, an IPC, um, uh, any, any instrument at all, even an X, even an Explorer, if you twist the handle of the, of the applicator, it starts to wring out the sponge. And so that's what I've, that's what I've learned. Probably it took me a couple of years to actually figure out, gosh, if I just twist it, I'm wringing the sponge out. And then when I get done, the sponge is dry and I know all the active peptide went onto the tooth. So um, that's kind of my, that's a little Novi nugget. If you I like that nugget. I'm going to dip it in ranch. It was delicious. <laughs> but yeah, I think this is kind of showing the wringing out yeah. The, the mop, like, you know, yeah. pushing it against itself. That that's a, a, a great way yeah. to do well, it. Well, thank but... you for showing you, you don't always use isolate with that. Cause I was going to ask you, do you turn off your isolate when you're using that? Cause I would be scared to have an isolate on that. It would suction away this platinum. So that was a dry shield and, and kind of like when I use it with glass ionomer, you, you can turn the suction okay. down. Okay. Yeah. But it's um, not sucking it away. Like I, you can yeah, literally cause... see the liquid pooling there. Yeah, I, I would never, I wouldn't let someone suction while I was doing it. We just got a quick question. I, just, I was, we could have answered really fast, but it popped off the screen. Um, Jeanette, do you want to quit? Do you want to talk about? We, you mentioned the thing about bleach. Do we want to talk about um, using? The, yeah, I think sure. The biggest thing to condition the surface, we got to get the pellicle off, and we got to get the the pores and enamel open, so this can actually get in there. So, if you think the patient has been using fluoride and has a hypermineralized surface on the outside of the tooth, you want to get that off with some sort of etch. But more importantly, if, if you're dry, rake and explore across that, that the surface of that lesion before you do it, if it's rough, I don't necessarily think you need to etch that because that the pores of that lesion are open. It's an active lesion. In that case, I would clean it with something like with sodium hypochlorite. And the reason we say sodium hypochlorite is because it's going to break down the pellicle. So we want to try to improve, we want to get rid of any proteinaceous stuff that's in between our active peptide and the, and the hydroxyapatite crystal. So we want to get all the protein off. All, certainly all the plaque off. Oh my gosh, please do not think of this stuff as plaque can be a <laughs> reservoir for this stuff um, because it's. I think this stuff would be inactivated on, on contact with plaque. So get get the teeth squeaky clean. Um, I've been using Live Fresh Gel to brush their teeth because I know that, that it strips the, the calcium valve. It truly gets the teeth squeaky clean. So I like that. You clearly using etch in this picture. And may I share that initially I thought this was an active lesion. So the first time I had applied it, I did not etch. And this, when I reapplied it in six months, I did etch. And by a year later, let me show you what this looked like a year later. I'm sorry, like I'm not the best photographer. So obviously the lighting isn't exact, but I think you can clearly see that there was pretty significant visual improvement. Uh, I think I'm so. Oh, I thought you froze. <laughs> Or you were just making a wow face. I was, I was <laughs> looking at that going, wow. So it's, yes, yeah. It um, but yeah, I, 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 um, and you know, we, I, I chat a lot with, um, Dr. Jeremy Horsekeeper and we were kind of talking back and forth about like, you know, do, is it really necessary to bleach? Is the bleach overkill? Can you just etch? So thank you for sharing your, your part. And, and, um, there are some of the studies, 
I would say the majority did add the bleach, but there are some that did not like the Elmo study from CareQuest that's going on. They're just doing the etch. Um, but anyhow. <laughs> I do you yeah, have I mean, like, input on that, Marzia? With... No, no, I just wanted to mention the fact that we know that the etching stuff for a few seconds is something that uh, it's useful just because it helps from the ionic strength of the area. So like, uh, but really literally three, four seconds also is uh, absolutely fine. Thank you for mentioning that because I think it's important. People, yeah, we don't want to put etch on these. Don't put etch on an active carries leisure for like 30 seconds. There's really no reason. You, just, you, you don't need to do that. So if you did put etch on these things to, to pre-clean them, like Marzia said, it's it's get it on and get it off. Um, I thought we might, but I, you know, I'm, a, I'm yeah, okay. Gosh. So link to, to this <laughs> But a trend of, of questions. There is um, there are also curiosity about how many applications do you need on uh, on one lesion? Well, I have been applying it annually to Amy's teeth, and she's just getting it annually. She only comes in once a year for her her profi, and then she and we apply this to all of her teeth, which gets into how many teeth could you apply it to? I can probably get. I mean, I would stretch. It's probably a stretch to get a full mouth application with four applicators, but I think four applicators could. You, could give you a full mouth application. If you if you knew what you were doing and you're judiciously applying it where you want it, you could do on a patient like Amy, full mouth and four applicators and four four unit doses. And Jeanette, I don't know if I, well you with kiddos, I would yeah, assume. Yeah, I mean you can you could definitely get multiple treatment sites with one applicator, particularly if they're in the same quadrant or half of the mouth and obviously adjacent teeth. Yeah. Yeah. And then the rest of that question was what, Marzia? Um, then there was like, a, does white spot change at all or just doesn't get worse? I have, I have seen it not get worse and I have seen them like in Jeanette's picture here, go away. Um, oh. I think everyone assumes that the white spot's going to go away. And it gets to one of the questions we were wrestling with before we even came online tonight, which was how deep does this stuff go? And Jeanette, you were saying to the bot, to the depth of the lesion. To the depth. <laughs> and I was, and I was like, well, it depends on the surface zone. Um, so these, these, uh, uh, these micrographs that, that Dr. McLean is putting up here, these are showing the, uh, the little, the peptide, the, the fibers that form as, as the peptide creates the scaffold, um, and, and, and how that attracts the, the calcium to create like a, a biomimetic hydroxyapatite. Um, and oh, there we go. There's the ceiling, the healing by secondary intention diagrams that I, that I think of. Um, yeah, I think it's important to not overpromise the aesthetics that the point here is, here is you're trying to regenerate the enamel and prevent cavitation. That's number one, right? Now, if you're talking gum line, posterior, interproximal, that's a no brainer. Now, if you have, my recommendation is if you have a patient who's extremely focused on the aesthetic aspect of it, right? And if they want 100% elimination of it, you, you're not going to have that instant gratification like you would say with resin infiltration where you know immediately whether it's going to work or not. And mind you, not every resin infiltration case will 100% improve a white spot, correct? So my thought, especially in these kiddos that maybe just got debanded from braces where you can't do resin infiltration for at least three months, like you alluded to, if you etch, especially with hydrochloric acid, which is the etch for resin infiltration, you are going to make a chemical cavitation in the tooth. Yeah. So there's this three month waiting period. You should be treating those with curadont, rebuilding the enamel. Hopefully aesthetically it will improve to a point where they're not really visible. However, um, I mean, you could do uh, resin infiltration if, if they need it to be completely gone, but you've seen some of my examples where it did visually improve completely. Um, it's about 90%, if I recall, of how much of the enamel is regenerated. So if you look at these images where, like the placebo, there's really no change and no remineralization happening there. But in the example with the curadont, P P11-4 is the name of the peptide. It's almost completely improved and, and remineralized. But I think the most important thing and why I wanted to show this is the hydroxyapatite crystals formed by curadont are a, a fan-like shape versus the prismatic shape like <laughs> our, our natural amylogenesis or like as, a, as our um, enamel forms naturally. So that's why it could potentially not 
completely eliminate the appearance of the white spot. It could shrink it. Like, look at these. So like, it's obviously improving, but you can kind of see a little bit, right? Um, so that, hopefully that, that helps. They, well, you know, you won't necessarily get 100% reversal. The, the point is you're trying to prevent this from getting worse or cavitating. Um, would you like to elaborate on that? I, I would like to elaborate on that, but I want to ask a question, Jeanette. Have you ever cut into a lesion that you treated with this because you thought that it needed treatment later? And what was your experience cutting into the enamel that had been cured on? I haven't, I have not had any of mine cavitate. So okay. I have not needed well, to cut into well, any of them. I haven't had any cavitate, but I had one on a teenager. It was very, I'm thinking of very high risk. Uh, she's actually not a teenager. I think she might be 20. Uh, went away to college, came back with inner proximal lesions, probably I would say E2 lesions. Um, but she's a very poorly controlled diabetic. And I've always struggled with this patient's very acidic plaque. Um, and we, we used Curidon on her. I actually gave her uh, the toothpaste um, because I, I said, this girl seemed really, she was, she was just petrified about needing uh, an injection, getting a, a restoration. And so I sent her home with, with the toothpaste uh, or sent her back to college with the tube of the toothpaste. And uh, I had applied Curidon in the office on her and she came back. She did not come back during the pandemic. She then came back after two years and we took a radiograph of the lesion. It didn't look like it had, um, it didn't, it definitely didn't look like it had, re it was arresting. So I decided to enter it, enter the lesion and, and cut into it. And when I did, the enamel is rock hard and the dentin, there was no infected dentin in it at all. It was the oddest dentin I've ever seen because it was squeaky clean in there. And I, it was one of those moments where I went, Whoops. good one, Brian, <laughs> good one. Yeah. Um, and you're the guy that people listen to for prevention, but it may, it actually that, I hate to say that one patient gives me much more mental certainty that I'm, I feel good about this product. I feel good about mm -hmm. what this is doing because that, when that, when I actually did cut into that lesion, which. I knew radiographically I didn't need to. All the carries, you know, all the all the carries management stuff says you don't need to cut into that. You can still try to remineralize it. And I was like, uh, no, but maybe it's not right. working. Sometimes and we're wrong. wrong. Yeah. You're you're yeah. you're still a good person. See, and I, and I'm <laughs> and I will and I'll be honest with you. I I it was I still I'm, I'm so glad sharing. I did it because we can all talk about it here tonight. <laughs> and you can you can hear from that experience. No, thank you so much. Um, actually, is um, it's very interesting what you're saying. And here there are like a, a couple of questions that we didn't have them listed before, but they're I think they're very interesting. Um, what do you think about using cordon repair technology on either patient with fluorosis or with MIH? I think that's very interesting. I, I've I've heard there's some new research coming out. I have not personally seen or read it yet, but it would be interesting to see, you know, I, I use SDF a lot for MIH because it's such a great desensitizer. Um, so it, it would be interesting to see uh, a research study specific to, to MIH. I personally haven't tried it on a MIH patient yet. Have, have you, Dr. Novi? I'm, I'm almost certain I have. I can't think of, I, so, well, I would have to say, I don't, I don't call, I don't want to tell you what I call molar incisor hypoplasia um, because I see a group of patients who are from a country called Cape Verde in the Atlantic Ocean where uh, I don't see molar incisor hypoplasia. I see full mouth hypoplasia and it's terrifying when I find out uh, that these were these patients, when I, when I find out I have one of these patients, I go, oh, I know what I'm, I know what I'm in for. And I know I've put Curidon on, on them. I can't think of any specific patients, but I know that my frustration with treating those patients has gone down. So something has changed when it comes to um, fluorosis. I, I don't think that I think trying, hoping that Curidon is going to fix fluorosis. It's not going to happen because fluorosis is not, it's not a demineralized white spot. It's, it's a fluorosis white spot. So this isn't going to, this isn't going to help with that. Um, so that's a, that's an interesting question. Thank you.
Okay, now there is it. Can I say one more thing? Can I just say one more thing? Please, 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 Dr. Navigo. This is something something that troubles me, is that a lot of us dentists think that we are smart and we think that we don't need instructions and we think that we can push the envelope on things and we think that we might be stronger than the people that invented these materials and smaller than the PhD chemists who worked on them. And I just want to share that when I have pushed the science of Curidon and said, I think it would be better if I added this to it. My findings were, no. Why don't you just respect the material, respect the elegant chemistry that the, that the, the real smart people created and mm-hmm. put into your hands, Brian, because um, it works better when you just let the chemistry do its thing on its own. If it needed something else in there, if it needed to be a two-step application of some sort, uh, we would have gotten that extra step in the product packaging so that you had both steps, right? Uh, and so I would be, I would, re- I would resist the urge to think, oh, I think it would work better if I add this after the fact. My experience has been, no, just let the chemistry work the way it's supposed to. Don't try to add anything to it. Um, that's been my experience. Okay. And then I, I just thought of something when, when someone was asking about the frequency of applying it, I think it's important to point out, this isn't like SDF or like SDF for an unrestored caries lesion. You're having to at least reapply it every six months. Technically you could do this once and just monitor. It's not like there's a frequency. So, I mean, you could do it every six months. You could do it annually. I think it's, it's uh, case dependent you know, to the individual, individualized care, it's not an automatic uh, reapplication cycle, at least not that yeah. I'm aware of. Would you agree? Yeah, I, well, least- I think we're going we're gonna to find out, right? I mean, <clears throat> look, people are picking this stuff up pretty quickly. Um, I mean, this, is, this isn't like SDF. I mean, SDF paved the way and we've gotten people used to the, used to the concept of, of remineralization and carries arrest. Mm-hmm. This, I think people are picking up a little more, I think probably at least 30% more quickly, people are, are gravitating towards this technology. And it's really exciting stuff, but we're going to learn over time, is it better if you apply it twice a year? Is it better if you apply it? Do you really need to apply it once? But I think it's going to boil down to what's the chemistry of the patient's mouth anyway, because then it's a really right. extreme yes. carries risk patient. They don't have you a lot of free calcium often. in the saliva anyway to drive into that new remineralization scaffold you put on the tooth. So don't expect it to work miracles in a patient who has meth mouth, right? This is for, <laughs> the, I mean, this yeah, is no, for the patients who have, who have things starting and you want to stop it before it, before it goes too far. Right. And, uh, and so, good but point. if you've got a, a patient who's willing to make sure that they, they do change their behavior and, you know, and so you, you don't do this in a vacuum and say, I put cured on, on and the problem is solved. You put Curidon on and we teach the patient proper oral hygiene techniques so they can go home and be self-sufficient. And we've given them a leg up to start the remineralization process because we all remember what Otto Backer Dirks taught us in 1955, that lesions remineralize. So lesions will remineralize, you just keep them clean. This gets you over that initial hump of, all right, we got it really clean in the office. Now you go home and take care of it because we've already started the remineralization process for you. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you. So there is another question that is more like on the practical side that was asked about what code is used for application, how much to charge, does insurance cover it, and who can apply it? Who's, who's, who are you asking? I think that was for Yes, for, for you, Jenna. Yes. So as we already mentioned, there's a code coming next year, a new CDT code, but currently the, mo- the closest code currently would be the SDF code 1354. Um, so you could use that. However, I would caution you in, in two ways. So number one, sometimes that will affect, um, like if you did have to do a restoration on the, they, they could put time limits, uh, number one. Number two, like let's say you're treating a Medicaid patient, which I treat Medicaid patients in my practice, our reimbursement for SDF is less than the ampule of the Curidont. <laughs> so, you know, you got to be realistic. So um, I will still do it. And it, it, it doesn't hurt as much, especially if there's multiple surfaces that I'm treating or multiple teeth, I should say, but just be aware of that. Um, some other unique ways until the, the new code comes out, you could do it under 1999, which is unspecified preventive procedure by report, or you could do 2999, which is unspecified restorative, and you could create your own fee. My suggestion would be 
or what we're doing is about double what our SDF fee is. This is a roughly a five minute procedure versus roughly a one minute procedure. Um, one minute you know, the material is minute, you do SDF in one minute, Jeanette. Of it to absorb, right? Okay. So I'm not talking about and okay. normally it's happening at the exam, okay. right? So you know okay. I'm maybe, sorry, I don't mean to give you a hard time. I was like the, wow. the absorption part. So roughly, okay. Then they again, both can be you, done you, in a short you, period you, of time. You, 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 I'm sorry, I'm interrupting. Go ahead. No, it's okay. But um, what was I gonna say? Uh no, I lost my train of I know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> it was about uh, how much to charge and uh, about the, the insurance. So, you know. yes. So, you know, and it's something you may have to do another treatment on that tooth again. We don't, we don't know. We're going to watch. Right. So I would recommend much like how I keep my SDF fee reasonable, you know, because I, I maybe I'm going to I have to reapply it every six months. Maybe it might progress and I have to do a restoration. Maybe I'm going to do maybe it's cavitated and I need to do a smart restoration. I find making it a fee that's similar to our fluoride varnish fee is is acceptable to the majority of patients and reasonable and, and covers our costs. Now, with Curidon, it is a little more expensive. Well, actually, it is a lot more expensive, like the ampule is at roughly $30 versus, you know, a drop of SDF could be less than a dollar, right? Um, so you need to keep that into consideration. But time-wise, it's not, you know, it's not like it's taking half an hour or 45 minutes like you would for a filling. So I would make it less than the fee of a filling and more than your SDF fee. We can't talk specific dollar amounts. And like, granted, I, I'm in Arizona, right? You know, our rent is not what it might be in Manhattan. So, you know, obviously the prices will vary depending on your practice overhead. But I think a good suggestion would be, you know, double, maybe triple SDF, but definitely less than uh, a filling fee. Um, maybe some people might disagree. What, what are your thoughts, Dr. Novi, in terms of pricing? Um, well, uh, I just came from speaking to the American Association of Dental Consultants where they were discussing just this, these, these very issues of, you know, what should be covered and how do you adjudicate these claims and whatnot. And uh, there was a, they were, they were asking me questions about what I thought. And of course, I shared my experience with Curidon. Um, from a payment perspective, I think that the difference should be half, uh, probably a third to half the cost of a restoration, because what okay. I've seen it in practice, um, I don't know that the payers or all payers are going to go to that level of reimbursement, but that would seem appropriate to me. And I think in the world of a of value-based reimbursement, which mm -hmm. some people may be, I mean, there's a lot of really cool stuff happening with pilot projects with value-based reimbursement and those, in those type of models, it makes, it makes perfect sense. Um, we're getting a question about, do you charge per tooth, per quadrant, per visit? It's really going to be dependent upon your payer and what they come up with for the frequency of lim their, whatever limitations they put on the code. The code is going to be a restorative code. I know that. It's not going to be one of the diagnostic or preventive codes. It actually is truly a restorative code because the code committee decided it was it was the code should really be enamel regeneration for this. Um, but I, I want to go back to, a, um, we got a question in the chat and I did, I decided to open up the chat while Jeanette was talking. And um, someone was saying, um, elaborate on the conditions that help or hinder remineralization. Um, would you give the patient some sort of handout or post-op instructions to go home and do something? I would be cautious with doing that. I, I really, I would exercise caution in terms of anyone who does disease management by not giving the patient in the game of remineralization. I don't think of remineralization as the patient is in the chair and I've got to treat this caries lesion just like I do a filling. Remineralization is a... Is a clinical treatment strategy where I'm giving the patient the option of, here's the deal. Most dentists would drill into your tooth and put in a filling. You know, I'm different. So here's the, here's the, here's the difference. I can put a liquid on there, which might reverse it, but the key is you're going to have to go home and change some of what you're doing. So if you're not willing to do that, we probably shouldn't try this, but I just want to make sure you have the option. Do you want to, do you want to change up your routine a little bit and get really gung ho about keeping this area really clean in the future? And if so, I'll put this liquid on there and we will try to stop it. And then hopefully you won't need to get that filling. But if you're not willing to do that, we're probably going to waste our time and money and resources. And I'm going to prevent putting this magical liquid in a kiddo who I'm going to see later this afternoon, who I really don't want that cavity to get any bigger. You're going to take this liquid because I only have one box of this stuff. I want to make sure the patient who gets it is going to be the patient is going to benefit from it because this stuff is super special. So, and that's what I would say to a patient and get them on board. So they go, crap, Brian put that really extra special stuff in mouth. They gave me the freaking lecture about, don't take this and it's not going to prevent me from giving it to the child who really needs it. 
and get the patient to go, I'm dang it, I'm going to go home and take care of these things. That's the way you do remineralization. You don't just say, I put some stuff in their tooth. Now you go home and take care of it because no one's going to do anything if you do that. Sorry. Thank you so much. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I mean, I will jump to a question that is a little bit later, but because I see that uh, there is uh, these things around SDF that keep uh, popping up. So uh, for Dr. McLean, how are SDF and Curodont different? What scenarios would you utilize one versus the other? And sure. how long is the application process? Right. So um, I, I know someone had asked, I mean, I've been asked this several times, like, oh, does this replace SDF? No, it doesn't. I still use SDF every day and will continue to use it every day. There are scenarios for which Curadont is not appropriate and, and likewise scenarios where SDF wouldn't be the best choice, right? And the more that you utilize these treatment options, um, the more patients that you see, the more familiar you get with it, the, the just faster you'll get it knowing, you know, which you're going to use for what. You know, the, the simple thing would be if you think about SDF, the bulk of literature, the bulk of clinical research surrounding SDF focuses on cavitated lesions. Well, right out the gate, Curadon is not, you're too late to the party for Curadon on, on a cavitated lesion. So if you're looking for a non-invasive option, you're going to, to SDF or you're doing atraumatic restorative treatment, say with glass ionomer, perhaps if they didn't want the stain of SDF. Um, et cetera. Now, as a pediatric dentist, a lot of these answers are, it, it can be more obvious because let's say you have a one, a two, a three-year-old, we're trying just to look at their teeth is like giving my cat a bath. Obviously, you're not going to be doing Curadon. Now, on one hand, you have primary teeth. And if you have parents who are more focused on safety and efficacy versus cosmetics, these are the parents who really don't want to put their kids to sleep or under deep sedation to, to restore their baby teeth. They want to look for al alternatives such as SDF. The literature has shown, and I see this every day, that the majority of parents prefer SDF regardless of the aesthetic downside uh, versus sedation. So, you know, you're still going to use SDF for those kids where you can barely keep the tooth dry for 60 seconds to, to brush the SDF on there, right? Um, now you're not going to do curadont because one of the steps is etching. You can't, you don't want to get etched on their face. You could cause a chemical burn. You're not going to be able to keep it isolated for five minutes for it to absorb. So just the level of cooperation will also determine which, which option and which way you want to go. Now, when you get into the scenario of, of permanent dentition, there's plenty of adults who are more than happy to do SDF, particularly in the posterior or proximal where maybe you're never going to see it, right? Now, on the other hand, in the smile zone, you're going to have people who obviously aren't going to want it and, and would opt for, for Curadon, right? Or even in areas you can't see, I do have some patients, particularly with their permanent teeth, who just do not want SDF, period, because they don't want the stain. So then you could do um, the Curadon. But now let's say we're talking about root surfaces, like this Curadon is not for root surfaces. SDF is amazing for that, especially in, in patients in nursing home facilities. And, you know, we have wonderful dental hygienists who are able to go out into nursing homes and apply to, to high risk sites like root surfaces. You know, I, I, I'm just seeing the, the, the little kids <laughs> or teenagers too. Um, but those are kind of the, the obvious aspects. Um, so cavitated teeth, uh, primary teeth, if they're too young or too uncooperative, they can't tolerate that roughly five minutes to isolate and, you know, apply etch, et cetera. Um, permanent teeth that aren't in the smile line, maybe they would still do SDF. I do use SDF for molar incisor hypomineralization, and it's amazing for hypersensitivity. I have it on my own tooth for hypersensitivity. So no, it's not replacing SDF. They just have different, they work differently and they fit into different, um, different places. So hopefully that answers that. It, do you feel like I'm missing anything on, on why to use one over the other? Cavitation, the aesthetic aspect, cooperation. May I, may I interject? Please. Um, I show a clinical case in my lectures of a root surface lesion that I have applied Curadon to that is now stabilized. Oh. Um, 
And I know we're, I, I don't want to get away from, you know, indications for use, but I, I pushed the envelope on this one patient okay. and, it's, and it's working. The cool thing about it is, and it's the same thing that I saw in your pictures of that ortho patient you put it on, is that you do see the gingival health improve around curodont treated lesions. Um, so it, there's something that happens when you improve the chemistry of the tooth surface it definitely makes the tooth surface more resistant to biofilm formation. You see the gingiva becoming less angry. Um, I mean, it makes sense with SDF considering the antimicrobial aspect of the silver. I don't, I know that I mean, I don't if the enamel is hydroxyapatite, why would that, I thought that I don't, or maybe they're just taking better care of their teeth. Well, and it could just be they're taking better care of their teeth. <laughs> Whereas and, like and, there's stroke patients where you apply SDF and literally they can't and do yeah. not brush and the gingiva does get better because it's antimicrobial. But it's one of the characteristics in the ADA carries classification system that if the gingiva adjacent to a lesion is healthy and it's not erythematous, it is likely an inactive lesion. So um, okay. When you're seeing gingival changes, if you're applying this to like a class five area, like the demineralization that Jeanette showed in the, on, I think it was tooth number 18, um, in that that one that you should like, wow, that looks amazing. I think it was 19, yeah. Was it 19 or? I'd say to a potato. <laughs> no, one is a second molar, one is a first molar. This is, is a it? primary second molar. So that, yeah, it's, well, see, it's I don't know uh, 19. I don't, it's okay. I don't know. I have, They're I'm just a smaller the, I still, version. It's I have an odontic version of my computer, the pediatric numbering <laughs> the, system, just so I can the remember. The dead giveaway. Okay, I hate to admit it, that, but I do. The cupping um, lesions are the dead giveaway. It's like okay, you have the brand. You anyway. know what? I can't see it. It's blocked with the chat that I opened to be able to answer everyone's well, questions. Close that chat. <laughs> All okay. right. So I, I don't want, I know there's so many questions. Let's keep going. What else? Hopefully that's enough on SDF. I, but I did see someone ask about the fluoride varnish. I, I do cover Curidon after five minutes with fluoride varnish. And there's multiple studies that did cover it with fluoride varnish. And many of the studies compared it to doing nothing or only doing fluoride varnish. And it was, Curidon is significantly better than fluoride varnish alone. Right. Otherwise right. we wouldn't be here talking about it. Like, you know, so yes, I, 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 you can cover it with varnish, but after five See, minutes. I don't, I, I wouldn't, I don't, but that, I mean, it's cool that we, that we, that we do it differently. I think dentistry is like cooking, like baking. We all have our recipe what works for us yeah. and we're all right. And we're all wrong. Like it's, it's all good. <laughs> it's all a little different. Maybe, maybe I can add it there because uh, what sure. we're experiencing now is that a lot of professionals are actually exploring, you know, the full potential of the peptide because there is still a lot of application that maybe we didn't have the chance to, to explore. So, you know, I'm happy to see that there is a lot of, a lot of curiosity also to, to push the limit of this technology, given that it's so, let's say, uh, so young uh, from, uh, let's say, application perspective. So, okay, then I'll go for another question. Um, for you, Dr. Novi, there was a question about is professional whitening recommended after teeth have been treated with corodont? Yeah, I, you know, that question, I, that question stumped me earlier today. I, don't, I wouldn't say it stumped me. It made me go, hmm, that's a, I, wonder why we're, I, wonder why we're, I wonder why we're asking that question. So for me, I think of whitening gel, especially 10% carbamide peroxide as an anti-caries agent. So I think that there's some benefit in using that product in the mouth from a perspective of gingival health and an anti-caries benefit. In terms of whitening a tooth after Curidon, I don't see any contraindication of whitening a tooth after you've put Curidon on. I, don't, I can't imagine anything's going to happen. Number one, whitening gel is very basic. This stuff is activated in acidic pH. So you're not going to I, I, what I certainly wouldn't do is put this, I wouldn't put Curidon on a tooth that's had whitening gel put on it recently because the chemistry would, it, in my opinion, would neutralize it, but I would leave that to a chemist to answer that question um, definitively. So I don't think there's any reason to think that you couldn't whiten a tooth after you've applied Curidon. Um, I, I would say probably if, if you're thinking along those lines, I'm thinking, let's find that patient's North Star. What's the patient's North Star? Is the patient's North Star white teeth or is the patient's North Star um, a healthy mouth and being disease-free and, and they don't have any cavities? I believe those two things can be united into one North Star for that patient. But if you're listening to that patient, they're going to be telling you, look, I really just want my teeth white. 
Now, I think cured out would be a great desensitizing agent prior to whitening. If you've got some, I know, you know, technically carries as a contraindication to bleaching. So I could see how you could use curadon. I mean, as a, I mean, I will be honest, I've got a sensitive number 18. I've been putting the cured on varnish on my, on number 18. And I'm like, wow, wow. <laughs> and then a couple of days later, I could zing. I'm like, I got to put more of my cured on varnish on, but I'm talking about, I we didn't want to talk about that. So um, what was the question? <laughs> it was about, about whitening. whitening. But you know, I, okay. I wonder if that might, that's a very common question regarding icon resin infiltration about when to whiten, whether oh, before or okay. after, and you can whiten teeth that have been treated with resin infiltration. I mean, ideally do it before because then the whole tooth will be that lighter color, but you can technically do it after as well. And like Dr. Novi already said, like there's nothing in this that would somehow prevent you from lightening the color of the tooth. You know, there's not a specific contraindication, but I don't, I don't know that it's been specifically studied. No, we actually did some uh, investigation and there is no like uh, no problem in uh, in doing Perfect. the whitening after the, the application of Kurodin Prepare, especially well, because- I answered the question correctly. <laughs> yes, <Yay>. you did. <laughs> you were right. <laughs> yes, yes, you did. I mean, even like from chemistry perspec uh, perspective, because anyway, the Kurodin Prepare will be already within uh, like the tooth and um, and we saw that it, it, it is not perturbated by, let's say, the, the outside- um, environment. Um, okay, so there is another question that uh, was uh, uh, with the chewing, does the corodont wear off on the smooth surfaces and interproximal? This is again is for you, Dr. Dr. Novi. Oh, I was like, I hope Jeanette doesn't get that question. Because <laughs> um, you're like chomping at the bit. Because I was chomping at the bit. Um, no, I, I no, it doesn't because this is not like varnish where you're you're it's, it's reacting with the surface of the tooth and you're getting this kind of synthetic hydroxyapatite like substance precipitating on the surface of the tooth that's then just kind of stuck onto the, the outer layer of the tooth. This actually went down into the tooth. I don't want to say like, like candida uh, fungus grows down into nutrient auger when you grow it on a Petri dish, but that's the way I think about it. <laughs> I mean, come on, come on. Come, there have Interesting be analogy. Well, there have got to be some microbiology <laughs> geeks out there who remember growing candida. Okay, go with it. Go plate. with it. Yeah. And okay, when you continue. grow candida on an auger plate, it grows like roots sure. down into the auger, which explains okay. why. If you have that analogy, you understand why when you put, when you wipe off that that white stuff from um from a patient and you're trying to diagnose candidiasis, you understand why it bleeds. Um, yes. because it's got those tentacles which are down in there. So I think of it like that. This is not like fluoride varnish where it's actually on the outside and it can, it yeah. can wear off because this has gone, it has chemically grown down into the tooth. And, and um, there was a question in the chat um, from Julie, how does, the, how does the lesion look radiographically? I have not seen the lesion change the big ones that I, the big ones that I've treated, the big interproximal lesions. And I've been, I have treated some D1 interproximal lesions with this stuff. And I have not seen them change radiographically. What I have, what I go looking for clinically or radiographically is not, is no lesion progression. There is some really cool technology coming out to monitor, excuse me, carries lesions at home by patients with their own, in their own bathrooms. And um, as we, as we couple this technology with that, we're, we're going to be putting oral healthcare into the hands of patients in their own bathrooms at home. It's going to be a game. It's already a game changer, but it's going to, it, right. it, the exponential change that we're going to see is I, I predict it's going to be overwhelming. Now the, the treatment, the liquid itself is radiolucent, but what we're watching over long periods of time, like the, the majority of that regeneration occurs in the first 30 days, but can continue for six months, a year. What we're hoping for over time is stability of the lesion size or, or even better, particularly in enamel, you could see um, increased radio opacity like this, uh, one of the papers showed where you're, you're seeing less of that gray triangle, you know, especially like in an E1, E2 lesion. Um, dentin, you wouldn't necessarily see as much uh, change radiographically. You just don't want it getting larger. <laughs> exactly. Then, and I think that's, that's really the key, right? People, we, number one, I think if, if the pandemic has taught me anything, we got to be really, really careful with bite wing radiographs now. I would say, I'm going to take, 
I, I, I'm much more apt to take bite wing radiographs than not take them now because CEJ carries freaks me out now. To see carries lesions creep in from the CEJ, it's, I think I see things blow up in so little time now that you didn't even notice six months ago, it's creeping in from the CEJ. And I swear- The I beauty of it. pediatrics. I'm like, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Walk a mile in my shoes, Jeanette. Walk a my mile goodness. in my shoes. I and just then but bathe, do, bathe cats, bathe cats with me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, so I have not seen it. I just don't want to see the, I don't radiographically, I don't want to see the lesion getting bigger. As long as it's not getting bigger, I assume the lesion has arrested. So I just would like to add something here, if, uh, if I may, that we have data even after like eight years showing how the radiograph actually evolve. And uh, what is interesting is to know that once the peptide is inside the tooth, the matrix will stay there for life. It means that uh, theoretically it will keep, uh, you know, driving calcium and phosphate from saliva and, and keep the remineralization process uh, ongoing. And this is why I think we were able really to have those uh, case uh, for a really long, uh, long time and follow them. Then I, uh, for what I've seen, it depends from management of expectation. It depends really on the patient and the, the let's say, the, um, uh, if it is more a cardioreceptive patient or not. Uh, in terms of how the remineralization will happen in terms of timeline. And, uh, but for sure, like uh, arresting, as you said, uh, Dr. Novi is uh, probably the first thing that you will see and is gonna be like uh, the first sign of success. And then the remineralization will happen over time. So just for you to know, we still have three minutes in uh, this webinar. So uh, we've yeah, been we have talking about- 297 more questions to <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Um, but I would like to use uh, this time, uh, maybe like to ask uh, a question to, to both of you um, about what could be for you the key home message that you want to give to the audience that uh, join us today about Curodont Repair Fluoride Plus and its uh, application. So first, uh, I would say Dr. McLean, so ladies first. I, I made the mistake of answering one of the questions by typing the answer in the chat. So I'm going to have to have, let's have Dr. Novi answer that first because I missed oh, the okay. question. Oh no, because I was hoping that she would have to go first and I could have time to okay, think. Okay, read it, reiterate it, reiterate it, or repeat. No, I can go. Sorry. I can I'm sorry. Go. I was I answering go. that there are studies go. with and without bleach. I appreciate you answering that question because I was just I was blown away that you, you were taking your, your, you were taking your job very seriously. Oh, Angela. let me answer it. Yes. <laughs> And so I don't really see, home, go ahead. My take home would be uh, give yourself, uh, give yourself permission to use three applicators before you, uh, before you think that you know how. So you just, just assume you're gonna use three applicators to learn how to use the material. Um, and I would, you, I would start with your team so that you and your team can get used to the um, one of you holding, placing an instrument and holding it, or at least just get used to manipulating the applicator. Because like we said in the beginning, it's not like dipping a micro brush into a unit dose. This is very, very different. You're wringing a sponge out onto the tooth. And so, the, and, but I think that's really key because this is uh, what I want people to take away is dentists, get out of here. Give your assistants and your hygienists the ability to treat caries medically with curadont and give them let use this to incentivize them to help you treat a disease unlike we've ever been able to do before and let them practice at the top of their license so that you're going to have more time to spend on those more difficult restorations while they're taking care of the smaller ones and heading them off at the pass and if you give them the flexibility and the freedom to do this their way and engage with patients very creatively, not just sitting the patient out and saying, I'm, the dentist told me to stick this stuff on your tooth and this is how it's going to go, mm -hmm. but really work with them to set those goals that really drive that behavior change that keep them healthy at home. And this gets them over that hump and maybe start with, you know, we're going to, we're going to make sure we have this stuff in the office at Christmas time when those freshmen come back from their first semester at college. And this is what we're going to put on those interproximal lesions. So maybe that's the way to use it. Or summer is coming up. Those college students who are coming back. So you may just want to start with a one patient population in your group to see. Let's just start with these really cooperative ones. Jeanette, you're doing it on the young kiddos. I'm doing it on elderly patients. That's why I'm treating the root surface lesions. But I think 
just give your team the freedom to really explore how they can deploy this. And you, I think you're going to see your team soar to new heights in terms of yeah. really taking the burden of controlling Carrie's disease off your shoulders and really owning the fact that these are their patients too. That's what right. I would say. And I know that was Thank a you. question is who, who can do this procedure? And, and the product is registered as an over-the-counter drug. So that's helpful. But, you know, technically your, your state dental practice act will guide, but in most states, a dental assistant, hygienist, basically anyone who can apply etch to a tooth could apply Curidont. So definitely utilize your, your team because um, then you can help more patients. I, I always delegate, whether it's, you know, SDF, Curidont, my assistants and hygienists can, can do it. Um, You're a good I, dentist, I, Dr. McLean. I'm I, glad I, you, I'm glad so you, are you. you. Um, I feel like I just want to rapid fire all these questions, but you want the key takeaway and, and this is going to get uh, a little interesting, but the repeat question that people are asking me is, you know, where does this fit in, you know, between icon resin infiltration and SDF? And the point is that this is different. I will repeat that this is the only and the first dental treatment we have that is guided hard tissue regeneration, right? It's not a topical antimicrobial or a remineralizing agent that works at the surface, right? To arrest and like stop mineral loss. It's actually rebuilding, rebuilding the natural tooth structure. On the other hand, resin infiltration is like artificially plugging in the voids in the tooth to try to arrest um, the carry. So another analogy, there's a, a brilliant dentist in the Netherlands, Dr. Lena, who has my all-time favorite analogy for carries and enamel, is that it's like playing the game of Jenga. Who's played Jenga? I you know. know, the tower <laughs> with the blocks, your enamel, the prisms of hydroxyapatite, it's like the tower of blocks in Jenga. And in that acidic environment, drinking soda, eating Takis, Gatorade, you can pull out the blocks, but the tower is still standing, right? You can pull a lot of blocks out. When you take too many out, the, the tower collapses. But okay, let's say we have all these missing blocks. You know, topical treatments like fluoride varnish, Prevident 5000, those are still great. I still use them and you should. Think of that like putting saran wrap around your holy Jenga tower. Like you're trying to block any more tiles from falling out, right? But it's still hollow inside, right? Resin infiltration is putting super glue in the holes, right? You're artificially trying to, to plug it up and fill it up with plastic and resin. Curidon is rebuilding the wood. <laughs> it's putting blocks back in, like you're rebuilding it. Curidon's there like is my bizarre. In those spaces so, to okay, it. this is, you know, think Curidon, Jenga, you're putting the blocks yeah. back in. I like that. There is Thank my, so was much. that good? Was it really okay. nice? Really, really, really <laughs> nice. Really nice. Okay. Thank you so much. Both of you really, uh, I mean, it was awesome to have you as panelists. It was awesome to listen to your experience and you, the way you interact. Uh, and oh, I mean, amazing. Thanks everyone also like for participating. I saw that you asked many, many questions. I will get them all uh, like down and try to make uh, like answer for all of them. And we will share the answer with the participants so that you also have, uh, I mean, if we didn't manage today to tackle all of those questions, we, you will have your answer in, uh, in the email. And um, yeah, so on behalf of Vivardis, thank you so much. We hope that we will do maybe another session uh, uh, in, the, in the last quarter of the year. And uh, we hope that uh, you will start using the product and let us know how it goes. And uh, you know, and spread the the the, the Kurdent community as much as you can. And um, thank you so much, and have a good uh, rest of the evening. Thank you so much for the opportunity. This was fun. Thank you, Dr. Marzia. Thank you, Dr. Brian. Good times. To you. And look, I'm still typing answers in the chat. <laughs> You're making me look bad. Stop. You're making me look bad. I gave up when we got to 200 questions. I was like, I can't. I can't. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Anyway, Thank thanks you. everybody. Thanks Have a so great much. night. Have a good night. Bye. Bye bye. bye.